Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jacqueline Goldsby. I'm chair of the African American Studies Department, and I'm really, really excited to see so many of you uh, here in our Zoom room uh, for our final session of the department's colloquium series, uh, which we call Endeavors. And this uh, semester, we've been devoting our thinking to the idea, the theme of Black Now, Conversations for the Revolution. Um, I wanna say a little bit about where we've been so far to kind of frame where we're going to land uh, today and, and also to give thanks to the, the people, the staff who've organized us for these past three months. So over these three months, we've been able to engage the vital issues facing black Americans and indeed all Americans um, as we've braced ourselves through a time unlike any other, right? In the context of a global pandemic, in a presidential election that tested the limits of American democracy itself. The stakes um, of what it means to secure voting rights and to turn back voter suppression could never have been higher than now. The stakes of organizing healthcare delivery as a right and practice of justice couldn't be higher than they are right now. And the stakes of producing art that could sustain critical hope in beloved community couldn't be higher than now. And the stakes of devising policies and activist programs that could dismantle the carceral state, its agencies, its agents, and the culture that sustains it so that, we, so that Black lives could thrive and matter at the same time. All of these issues have been absolutely at the forefront of our thinking this term. And we've been very fortunate to have a series of activists, artists, and scholars come and talk to us about these very issues. And so I wanna thank those who have been in the Zoom room before today, Latasha Brown, Amy Cox, Emily Wang, Dwayne Betts, Titus Kafar, Claudia Rankin, Philip Goff, Philip McHarris, and today's speakers who will be introduced to you in just a few minutes, uh, seconds really. Uh, I wanna thank them all for sharing their wisdom, sharing their work, doing the work, and giving us the challenge of asking ourselves what is to be done and what can we do to advance the cause of justice. If you wanna see these, video, um, these uh, talks, we've posted them um, and this is why you're being recorded today. You can access these earlier discussions on the African American Studies Department's website, go to the videos tab and you can learn a lot about what we've been thinking about this past semester. I wanna thank the staff that's helped us organize these conversations. I first of all want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, Indigeneity and Transnational Migration. Uh, the director, St Professor Stephen Pitty and the Assistant Director, Matthew Tanico have been absolutely brilliant and wonderful in supporting us uh, to organize this series, including um, the whole process of getting the videos mounted through Yale's YouTube channel. I never knew how much work that entailed. And Stephen and Matthew have been really supportive in that. Um, Vanessa Epps, our newest staff member in the African American Studies Department has been a tireless PR engine for this series. And I really wanna thank her for her work in getting the word out. Um, I wanna thank Emmanuel Bissell, who's been our technical support these last three months and making sure that the Zoom room runs efficiently and that no connections are dropped. It's been amazing. Um, and last but certainly not least, I wanna thank Professor Crystal Feimster, whose absolute acute intelligence has, uh, she's curated the series with a, with a kind of verve and insight and energy and care that has really, really been remarkable. I've learned so much because of her. So I just wanna thank Crystal and the staff for all of their work. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Themster who will introduce our guest today. Thank you so much, um, Jackie, um, as always for bringing us into the space um, with such um, profound words and acknowledgement um, of the work that we do and the work that still needs to be done in these days where um, everybody is thinking about 
um, the fragility of Black life. Um, I want to add my uh, thanks um, to yours. I'm, I'm not going to name everybody um, that you did, but I do want to, again, thank, thank Vanessa Epps, who has been my right hand um, in this whole process of, of bringing um, everybody together in this Endeavor series. Um, moreover, I want to thank all of my colleagues. None of this would have been possible without folks agreeing um, to show up and to show out in many ways, whether as interlocutors for the conversations or as um, the keynote. Um, and so I want to thank everybody for their part in making this happen. Um, on that note, I do want to get us started. Um, we have a little bit of time here and we want to make the most of it. Um, and I want to just, for those of you who are new to the format, um, just sort of, sort of reiterate what the format is before I introduce our three speakers today. Um, we, as, as um, Professor Goldsby mentioned, we are recording the, these and we really want to try to keep as many people out of the frame as possible um, besides our speakers. Um, and so we will start um, with um, our um, interlocutor, um, Gwen Prouse, will kick us off um, at um, one at 12.45, we will open up for Q&A, but we do it in the Zoom way. Um, and we will ask that you send your questions to Gwen Prouse in the private chat. She will curate the Q&A um, and make sure that all your questions are addressed and, and, and and I know they will be answered brilliantly by Elizabeth and Tracy. Um, I will remind you in the chat, oh, we've reached that time. So please send your questions to Gwen um, and then Gwen will, will, will present those to the presenters. We do end at 1.15, um, so we won't be holding people over. Um, so on, the, on that note, let me begin by introducing some of my favorite people, um, friends and colleagues. Um, Tracy Mears first, who I've known for since the day I arrived here and has welcomed me into the community of scholars here at Yale and my family into the community of New Haven and I'll always be grateful for that. Tracy Mears is the Walton Hale Hamilton Professor and Founding Director of the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School. Before joining Yale, she was um, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School from 1995 to 2007. She was the first African-American woman granted tenure at both law schools. Mears is nationally recognized expert on policing in urban communities who has worked extensively with the federal government, including being a member of President Barack Obama's task force on 21st century policing. In 2019, Mears was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth Hinton is an associate professor in the Department of History and the Department of African American Studies at Yale. And I hope, like Tracy, welcome me. I hope that I'll be a person who can help you and your family adjust to life in New Haven in the post-COVID moment. It's just been so hard um, at this at this time. But I hope you know that um, the department um, and all of us are really pleased to have you among us and can't wait to sort of meet your daughter and hang out over drinks in person. Um, so um, Hinton's research focuses on the persistence of poverty, racial inequality, and urban violence on the, in the 21st century United States. She is considered one of the nation's leading experts on criminalization and policing. In her book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America, published by Harvard University Press, Hinton examines the implementations of federal law enforcement programs beginning in the mid-1960s that transformed the domestic social policies and lay the groundwork for the expansion of the U.S. prison system. And my students read about three chapters of um, from the War on Poverty in my long civil rights course this year. And it really made a difference, kind of changing the way that I organized that course and the way it ends. Um, so I'm particularly grateful for that work. Um, so thank you, Elizabeth. 
I'm also finally, but not least, um, happy to introduce um, Gwen Prowse, who is one of our amazing PhD candidates in the political science and African-American studies um, department. Um, Gwen has become one of those people that I often call on to do extra work, um, no matter what kind of um, series or workshop I'm working with, I always think of her and her work, the kind of intersectional work that she's doing, interdisciplinary work that she's doing. And so I'm especially grateful because I think this is the second request that I've made of her to participate in um, one of the workshops or series that I've been a part of this year. So nothing but gratitude to you, Gwen. Um, Gwen um, focuses her, uh, the focus of her research is grassroots political mobilization in U.S. cities. Her work in multi-methods and, and aims to involve community members in every step of the research process. She is a research fellow with the Institute for Social Policy Studies and an affiliate with the Justice Collaboratory at the Yale Law School. She is a um, co um PI with Veshla Weaver and Tracy Mears for the Portals Policing Project, which examines how police, um, citizens, police and citizens interactions shape political knowledge and political discourse in majority Black communities in the, in the United States. Thank you all. And I'm going to turn it over to Gwen. Thank you so much, Professor Feenster. Can everyone hear me? OK, great. Um, thank you, Professor Feemster, and thank you, Professor Goldsby, Vanessa Epps, and our partners at RITM. Um, I'm deeply honored to be moderating today's discussion between two scholars who I admire so much. Um, that we're ending this semester's Endeavor series in conversation with Professor Mears and Professor Hinton could not be more appropriate. Professor Mears is the co-founder of the Justice Collaboratory. Four out of the six speakers of this semester series are active members of this group. Dwayne Betts, Dr. Emily Wang, Professor Philip Atiba Goff, and of course, Professor Hinton. Together, collaboratory members demonstrate how health, safety, art, and education, and the many ways in which they intersect and overlap are foundational to a future where Black freedom is possible, where a third reconstruction is on its way. From their standpoints and expertise, they name that the steps on the way toward revolution are both complicated and absolutely necessary and urgent. They don't just study these ideas, they push them toward policy. Many demand that those most intimately affected by the carceral state participate and lead. Meanwhile, Professor Hinton's work as a 20th century historian reminds us that this type of work is not new, that reckonings have happened before and in the not so distant past, that waves of democratization in the US have coincided the growth in surveillance, punishment and control of black and indigenous peoples and migrants. In her articles, books and op-eds, Professor Hinton reminds us that the bold recommendations of the Kerner Commission in 1968 following the wave of urban rebellions in response to police violence um, she reminds us how the fear of white racism, quote, um, fomenting domestic turmoil led to liberal policymakers distancing themselves from these very recommendations. This may sound tragically familiar to discourse today, um, but today I'm so excited to talk to these two scholars and bring them in conversation with one another um, for all of the tireless work they're doing to reverse that course of history um, in collaboration with others, community, and many scholars. Um, so I'm going to begin first with, um, with the topic of the Justice Collaboratory. Um, and if Prof Professor Mears, um, you'd like to begin just to talk a little bit about the Collaboratory, um, its genesis, um, and then Professor Hinton, if you would like to talk a bit about the work that um, you've come to do within that space. Unmute. It only took nine months to figure out how to do that at the beginning before one speaks, right? Um, thanks so much for the introduction, for having us, um, and for the opportunity to, to be among friends at the end of the semester. Also, that 56 of you turned out 
on what is essentially close to the last day of semester is pretty impressive. So thanks for that. Uh, the collaboratory's origin is in um, um, a social science research project, essentially, um, a collaboration um, between the Center for Policing Equity. I think I saw Philip Atiba Goff somewhere in this Zoom room um, when he was at UCLA um, and some folks at John Jay came together to put together a demonstration project that was funded uh, by the Department of Justice to bring together our various research streams and um, come up with some policy approaches uh, to you know, see if we could make some kind of a difference. You know, it wasn't an attempt to fundamentally reconceive safety as we understand it should happen, but certainly an opportunity to bring science to policy, which is um, an important thing that the collaboratory has stood for. Um, as as um, I think many have noted and many members of the collaboratory have noted that too often policy um, is has no theory <laughs> and certainly has very little evidence. And we like to proceed from the standpoint that, you know, evidence is a set of facts and offered that are offered an answer to a question. And one doesn't know what questions to ask unless one is actually appropriately guided by theory. What works is not a real question, right? Um, so that was the beginning. And, you know, with that, with those initial resources, we were able to put together um, and attract a, a group of incredible people who are interested in working on this project, uh, broadly conceived. And so today, I would say, you know, we're much more forward looking I mean, there, um, in terms of not just thinking about in an emergency context and extremists, what are some things one could do uh, to, to in, in policy terms to make existing organization systems and the like less harmful, but um, trying to work out much more a, 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 a thick and broad theory of what broad community vitality means um, and how that is centered around concepts of justice. And, and the last thing I'll say is I don't want to go on blah, blah, blah. Um, but once you take seriously the idea of community vitality as a goal, then one understands that um, one must center the people <laughs> whose safety demands are relevant to said policy, right? Um, and that seems like a really simple thing. Um, an obvious thing um, to do, um, but as we've seen historically, as I'm sure Elizabeth will discuss, um, those constant efforts at doing that have, have been de derailed. And uh, I think it's our hope that we can, you know, try once again <laughs> to, to, to deepen and center and provide a, a, a more robust multidisciplinary theoretical framework ar around that approach. Um, before I, I talk about the collaboratory, I also want to thank um, Crystal and, and Gwen for those uh, really tremendous introductions. Thank you. Um, thank all of you for coming. And of course, it's an honor to be in conversation with, uh, with Tracy. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And this um, also is kind of like my first uh, big public um, appearance as a Yale faculty member, which is um, really exciting for me. I um, I just arrived here in the summer, but I've been on leave this term, um, madly finishing up a book manuscript, which maybe I'll talk about some later, um, and excited to be fully on next term and begin um, teaching here. And so this is, um, this is I, I, I'm just excited for this because I, it's, it's part of my kind of like welcome into the community. So thank you. Um, so actually, I mean, a big pull for me coming to Yale was to be a part of the Justice Collaboratory and of course, um, the African American Studies Department and among, um, in conversations with scholars whose work I really admire. But what the Justice Collaboratory has increasingly done, I think, um, too, with the addition of, um, of Phil Goff, as, as Tracy mentioned, is really bringing together um, an interdisciplinary group of scholars who 
is attempting to tackle and make meaningful changes in um, the kind of landscape of, of safety and, um, and criminal justice today. And I think the community centered model um, through which much of the Justice Collaboratory's work is done is really inspirational to me. And I think um, what, is, what is going to be key if we are to, as, as, um, as Jackie mentioned at the outset, you know, dismantle um, the carceral state and, and, and institutions which have um, really functioned as the engine of racial inequality post-civil rights. Um, I, I'm kind of coming in, hitting the ground running in some senses because I'm working with Dwayne Betts, who um, you heard from earlier this term, um, the amazing poet and, um, and legal scholar um, who is, who, and this is, this is totally Dwayne's, you know, brainchild and idea, and I, I'm just kind of here supporting him, um, but he is directing the Million Books Project, which, um, which will institute um, 500 uh, book capsules into, um, into prisons and juvenile detention facilities um, across the United States and Puerto Rico. And this is an incredibly ambitious project, right? Because it's seeking to um, give prisoners access to an entirely different set of, um, of reading materials and educational materials that they, that they don't have access to in the sense that most prison libraries, you know, they, it, it's like full of um, like Tom Clancy novels and really, really outdated um, pieces of literature. And so Dwayne, um, is going to really transform the, the kind of landscape of what the kinds of reading materials that prisoners have access to. And it's, um, it's a combination of the 500 books, we're still in the process of choosing what they're going to be. And this actually has been um, the project launched this summer. And it's, you know, it's a big task to figure out like what 500 books um, we think, you know, kind of like best represent what needs to be um, in prisons across the United States today. So we're still finalizing the list, actually, I'm meeting with Dwayne right after this to, to talk about that. But it's a combination of literature and, um, and history and political science and sociology um, that will really give, provide a new kind of robust curriculum inside prisons and, you know, in itself as a kind of, you um, established library, we hope that it'll um, help foster discussion and, and community organizing and mobilization inside um, inside prisons. And so far, you know, we've just been, we don't have the 500 books finalized, but in just a few months, we've already got several thousand books into 80 different prisons in 30 different states. So already this project is making a humongous difference um, in the lives of people who are incarcerated in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is um, literally wreaking havoc um, inside the nation's prison system. Um, and just one last plug on that, um, Dwayne and, um, and also Hardy, who actually was a student of mine, it is a PhD student of mine at Harvard, I'm her advisor, who's now a first year student at Yale Law School. Elsa and Dwayne are, um, are hosting a podcast um, featuring authors who are um, included in the collection. And this podcast will be available to the public, but it'll also um, be available inside prison. So um, look out for that. And this is just one example, I should mention the last thing, that the Justice Collaboratory housed the Million, the million book, Books Project, but it was made possible by a humongous $5 million grant from the Mellon Foundation. And so this is just one example of the kinds of programs that the Justice Collaboratory supports and the kinds of real difference um, the Collaboratory is making in terms of the landscape of incarceration and also policing and public safety and community vitality, as Tracy mentioned. Thank you so much to you both for providing an overview of the origin of the Justice Collaboratory and also one of the specific and crucial projects that's taking place right now. Um, Tracy, you, um, you said earlier, if community vitality is the goal, one must center the people whose safety demands are relevant to policy. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like in research, in research or within the collaboratory. So, what is it? What does it mean to center uh, those whose safety demands are most relevant to policy in social science research or legal research, and perhaps um, Elizabeth in the archive? So, let me give you two examples of how you might go about doing it, um, and then let me say something about what it's not, um, and then let me say 
something about what I don't know yet. <laughs> okay, so um, point one, how you do it. Um, the first example I would point to is our own project, uh, Ms. Prowse, which is the portals policing project. Um, if you Google portals policing project dot com, um, you can actually see um, what we've done. We've again taken an art project. Actually, it's an art installation um, promoted by Shared Studios, where people are able to connect with one another through some pretty sophisticated tech. So think full body Zoom in a golden shipping container where members of um, communities that we tried to identify some that where people experience um, higher than what is average, we'll call it, um, impacts of violence, whether we're talking about interpersonal violence or police violence, right? And ask them about their experience with both violence um, and police and the state's response to it generally. Um, by listening to those conversations, one can easily ascertain that what I would call stakeholders, right? People who experience both the problems that the state typically sends general purpose armed first responders to address, um, how they deal with um, both those problems and the state response and their own conception of what they think the state's response should be. Understand importantly, that their own conception of what the state's response should be isn't necessarily a conversation about how, poli how the policing service as we know it could and should be different, although there is some of that. It's literally a conversation about what the state's response should be. And in a lot of the work that I'm doing myself, which is relevant to the my point three, I don't know yet, um, is it, thinking very seriously about a set of public goods, the state's provision of public goods, um, what the police power means in that context. And that is a term of art, everyone. So police power in law is not the policing service that as we know it, the police power is the state's ability to regulate um, and support health order and such for its citizens. So any state response to the pandemic right now, like vaccinations or or more generally requiring that people go to public schools, for example, and get a certain level of education. That's actually an exercise of the police power. We can come back to that later. Um, but in any case, um, that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is to, is to invest really heavily in um, what uh, it, the term of art is CB par. It, it, it's community-based approaches to, to research where you actually design research projects in collaboration with the members of the communities with whom you're working and, and, and studying. Uh, that's much more common in medicine, although even in medicine, um, that is, you know, on the fringe, frankly. Um, Emily Wong does a lot of this work, who is also a collaboratory member. Um, Elizabeth and I are actually partnering with Emily right now on a, on a project in concerning um, COVID detections in incarcerating, uh, incarceration settings, as well as developing protocols for um, vaccination and who gets um, vaccinations first by actually, again, centering people who are affected, people who are in the incarcerative settings. That's a CBPAR um, approach. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in doing in the collaboratory is doing more of that work. CBPAR approaches on the social science side. Um, it's difficult to do because foundations don't typically pay for it, right? And so, you know, trying to figure out how to design those kinds of things are difficult. So that's one answer, how. Um, what it's not. What it's not is thinking about a top-down approach to, for example, when you think about safety saying, well, you know, uh, homicide rates are high. The best way to approach homicide rates are sending more police, armed first responders to dealing with it. This is what um, Mayor Bloomberg and, and Ray Kelly did in New York. And you should be grateful <laughs> that fewer people are 
being killed because we have decided what the, the best approach is. Or to put it differently, I'll use a, a kind of outside example. Um, think about um, online interaction, social media. Um, the Justice Collaboratory also has a whole thing that we do <laughs> uh, 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 in the social media space, actually. Um, and, you know, that approach would be to say that the best way to have health on in the social media is just to uh, focus on content moderation and rule violations rather than to take an approach where you could seriously um, think through the architecture of interaction that people have in that space um, and think about it in a healthful way, right? Don't ban cars because cars are dangerous. Figure out how to have better lighting on the streets, have rumble strips on streets, take curves out of roads, right? So that people can have egress in a more healthful way, right? That, that's two ways of thinking about it. Here's what I don't know. Point three, um, we started out talking about um, you know, a more robust theory of community vitality, which I think is a, a center part of, uh, of achieving justice um, because so many people have been involved so long in the negative project. You know, figuring out articulations of a theoretical approach to that other than something like, you know, everybody should have equal capacity to fulfill their goals and projects. You know, that's a goal, but it's, it's sort of not like a, a, a robust theory of, of how to do it, what it means, how you study it. Um, that's the part I don't know. And so, you know, one small thing I'm doing is to think about, for example, the police power um, and, and recover that as something that, that's positive, um, that citizens deserve, that citizens deserve to have their state working for them um, and uh, providing a set of public goods um, for flourishing. Yeah, just continuing. I mean, some of some of the 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 issues that Tracy raised. I mean, I think so much of it has to do with the um, the voices that we choose to privilege and center, and I think that goes into the ways in which we um, that we read the archive. And it's really difficult. Um, you know, the archive does not often capture the most um, marginalized and oppressed voices. And I think, especially. Uh, when it comes to policing and, and crime control in low-income communities of color in the late 20th and early 21st century, it's um, it's really difficult, which is part of the reason why a lot of the interpretation that we have that is um, based in archival sources does tend to privilege a narrative that um, that that talks about the 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 kind of the the demands for law and order, tougher sentencing, more police um, that were emerging from communities that were over police, especially um, by the time we get to the war on drugs in the 1980s. But I think there is a different way to read that and to read the sets of demands that people are making in the Portals Project, but also in the 1960s. The the project that I'm working on right now um, considers uh, Black Rebellion from the you know, mid 60s really to the present. And, um, and especially in the kind of six, the late 60s, early 70s, 68 to 72 period that we don't really think about. And, the, and my kind of you know, primary source base for this work are newspapers, um, archival records of radical civil rights and black power organizations that were working on anti-police issues and oral histories. And you know, there are, even within the newspapers, right? You, you can, if you privilege the, the voices and perspectives of those people who participated, who resorted to uh, political violence in order to make a set of demands on the state, if you privilege their perspectives and their demands and, and actually take seriously when they say, you know, we want, uh, we don't want to live in shacks anymore. We don't want rats and roaches in our apartments. We want um, new kinds of investment. We want jobs. The kids don't have summer jobs in our communities. These are the demands that we, where people were making and an incident of police violence ended, ended up usually being the precipitating incident. So, you know, very often we kind of focus on the on the um, the material results instead of actually centering the people who are in the ground zero of where um, where these repressive measures are implemented. So, I think a lot of it has to do with like who we who we choose to privilege and how seriously we take the demands of, um, 
of, of people who are living in communities that are over police and underprotected and under resourced. And I think because of the position of many of the people living in these communities, they're often not really listened to. And as Tracy mentioned, you know, the response, the immediate knee jerk response historically ends up being um, more police. And this gets into something that um, uh, an idea that I've developed with um, with just a collaboratory member and former Yale professor who's now at Johns Hopkins, uh, Beshla Weaver and Julie Kohler Hausman, who's a historian at Cornell, that's called selective hearing. And um, we wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about this. And one of the things that we argue is that, you know, like we ask the question, like, why is it that despite like all of the demands that black people make on the state, like the only demand that gets consistently taken up is like policing, sentencing, prisons, et cetera. And so, you know, we call this concept selective hearing because when black communities are saying we want better policing, you know, what, what Tracy's talking about, like we want protection, we want the state to work for us, we want uh, control over what public safety in our communities look like, instead of like actually giving that, right, what, what policymakers and politicians and law enforcement officials hear is, okay, better policing, that means more policing. So again, it's like the selective hearing concept. And I think one of the key challenges, and it is really a challenge, I think, um, you know, a lot of the responses to the protests this summer and the kind of um, the, the, the robust national discussions about police brutality that emerge, you know, really shows is that, you know, this is not, um, you know, the selective hearing is still going on and people are still not being listened to. And we're at a moment when um, in order to achieve the kind of community vitality that Tracy's talking about, um, these perspectives really, really need to be um, to ground any kind of uh, change moving forward. Um, thank you so much for those responses. And I think this this point about selective hearing and uh, in the policymaking process um, leads me to ask another question that I wanted to bring to both of you today, which is, you know, both of you have served in various kind of policy making. Um, public capacities outside of using your work as scholars to inform um, the policymaking process at the local level um, and at the national level. Um, I know, Tracy, you served on the President's Task Force um, on 21st Century Policing. You're now on the Board of Police Commissioners in New Haven. Um, and then, Elizabeth, I understand you've done some work in Stockton, California. So something that I, um, I'd love to hear from both of you and you know, maybe, maybe Elizabeth, you'd like to start first. Um, then, uh, you know, what have you learned about institutions in the process of serving um, in these roles? Um, and how, um, yeah, how, how have you been able to contribute, uh, contribute your work as a scholar, but also how has this, um, you know, how has, how have these experiences maybe complicated or frustrated what you know about, um, the state uh, through your research? That's a great question. I'm, I'm also, um, I'm eager to, to hear, I'm glad I'm going first because I want, I, want, I want to know what Tracy, Tracy's response to what I, to what I have to say. Um, so yeah, as Gwen mentioned, I've been working um, for the past, wow, it's been four years now with the, uh, with the police chief of Stockton, California, Eric Jones, who's, um, who's one of the most, if not the most um, progressive chiefs in the country. Um, he was, it's now over, was part of um, this, this program called National Initiative for Safe Communities, which, um, which uh, started like kind of a, as a post-Ferguson thing on the Department of Justice to really implement um, procedural justice. Uh, Tracy's um, kind of model for policing in the, in the 21st century in um, six pilot departments, um, and Stockton was chosen as um, as one of them. And uh, I was hooked up with Chief Jones because he was really open to using history um, as part of what he was calling a racial reconciliation effort between uh, the police department and um, and residents of color in Stockton. And he basically, you know, said you can have access to our records um, in order to help us better understand the history of kind of racialized enforcement and so that we can use this historical evidence to ground our discussions moving forward. Um, Stockton's department also had a really robust procedural justice training set up and especially um, a, a module within that training that spent a day looking at the history of racist law enforcement, which um, at least to my knowledge, 
you know, the, the amount of time spent on looking at kind of the history of, um, of police oppression of, um, of black and brown communities is really kind of unmatched. Um, you know, they, they do a day long training that goes from, you know, slavery and the black codes all the way up to the modern day. Um, and this, you know, a lot of this information is completely new for um, most of the police officers. So m part of my task was to talk to people in the community and, and, um, and scour these records to kind of uncover various incidents that could be put at the center of the training, but also in the listening sessions that were being held between police officers and, um, and, and community members. And, um, you know, the, the idea was in part because a lot of the, the kind of like the history module training was focused on, um, you know, like police complicity and, and lynchings and other forms of racial terrorism that seemed for many officers very far away from Stockton. And so this process is ongoing, um, but it has been, um, I think something that's been, you know, really incredible to see. Um, and even the effort to, uh, for, these officers to reckon with this history, I think is, is really important and a step um, towards improving general relations with the community and, and, and improving trust, which is one of the kind of um, big principles of, of procedural justice. But it's also, you know, I, I think Stockton in some ways, um, you know, the, the pro there are a number of problems, right? I mean, one is that even if police administrators buy in to this kind of uh, these kinds of discussions and, um, and the idea of, of, of racial reconciliation, if you want to call it that, um, there, there is a disconnect between the, the you know, administrators like Chief Jones and Scott Medores, who, who does the, um, the, the history module training and the rank and file officers. So there's not necessarily, you know, what's required is a, is a humongous cultural shift to get rank and file to really buy in and to really um, begin to change the ways in which they patrol targeted um, Mexican American and, and, and black communities in Stockton. And it's also, you know, as part of that work too, um, I, last year, I, um, I, I was a instructor in, a, in the California Command College where basically police administrators, um, you know, go to, they, they do like a month, several month long intensive um, educational immersion experience. And so I came in one day to talk about, um, racism in policing. And it was a really, for me, a really like intense and informative experience. And I realized then that like so many, you know, even in this moment when, and it's not just Chief Jones, right? You have um, former uh, heads of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and, and police chiefs around the country, you know, beginning to apologize for things like lynching and beginning to say, we need to listen to community in new ways. We need to reckon with um, the history of, of police violence, especially directed against people of color. Um, again, a lot of other administrators, a lot of rank and file think it's complete BS. They think it actually prevents them from being able to do their jobs. They think that, um, you know, in many senses, like any, any kind of police reform, um, especially one that is, you know, kind of centered in notions of racial justice, um, you know, doesn't allow them to, to perform their duties as police officers as they see fit. So, you know, on the one hand, I, you know, I, I go to Stockton and I'm, I'm you know, I, I, we have a great listening session or there's a really powerful training and I'm feeling like, okay, you know, this is like planting the seeds of change. It's not necessarily the end of itself. And then like, I go down to San Diego to do this training and I'm hearing, you know, a bunch of other police administrators say this is complete BS and, um, and we can't do our jobs because we're scared of being called racist and this and, you know, knowing this history doesn't help us do police work in the present. So um, we still have a very long way to go. <laughs> It's funny, you said you wanted to hear what I had to say. I mean, I'm like, well, you know, welcome to my life. <laughs> <laughs> what have I been doing for the last decade? I mean, you know, I, 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 think, um, I think being a lawyer makes it easier for me to sit with that disjuncture, um, you know, because I have my theoretical goals. I have the stuff that I do in the day to day to both just make what exists less harmful <laughs> because we're an extremist, but also 
um, you know, like you said, inch forward. But also, I think being a lawyer, I have a really much more detailed sense of all the ways in which it's hard, which are not just about people's psychology, um, not just about the ways in which organizational forms cause people as a psychological matter to just sort of like try to get through their day. You know, like part of what you're talking about when people say this doesn't make my job any easier is just the day to day, most people in their day to day just, you know, want their day to be as easy as possible. It's the status quo and not, they're not actually trying to challenge themselves and, and change. And I'm, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm just being descriptive, right? Um, for most people, they don't want to get up and be like, what's the hardest thing I can do today? You know, that's just not what people do, right? Um, and then you add to that the way government works in this country. Um, Federalism is a huge issue. I mean, and, and I actually think for, for folks, you know, I, I'm sure most educated people are just aware of it, but, you know, when you actually do not study it, you don't understand the complexities that that governmental arrangement gives you, okay? So, you know, I've done the federal president's task force. Um, you know, I also just got off of a, a statewide force to re to think about how post should change its training for the new Connecticut use of force statute, which, which has its own federalism issues, given that there are a gazillion tiny little cities in this state um, and no regional government and like, you know, managing those people to raise them to a basic floor is very difficult. And um, on Tuesday night, I sat for two hours um, as a commissioner on the New Haven Board of Police Commissioners, you know, where we had the beginnings of, you know, we had a discussion about the relationship between the New Haven Police Department and Yale's police department, which of course is intimately tied up in the fact that this university um, doesn't have to pay state taxes and that the city is under-resourced. And so how you think about delivering safety to people in this city um, who are right now, how, how many times have I used the word extremist? <laughs> the homicide rate today in New Haven is double this year what it was last year. Shootings are up by 85%, okay? Um, so in a context like that, when people are saying to folks in the city, take away the one thing that you believe, I'm not saying they're right, it's like what they believe, you know? The one thing that you believe is making you safer, that is, you know, reduce the number of Yale police officers who can enforce the law when people in this community think that makes them safer. And in some cases, I think they're right. You know, when the Yale Police Department handles 20,000 calls for service per year that the New Haven Police Department would otherwise have to handle and doesn't have the resources, it's a complex issue. It's just really complex. And so, you know, th there are no easy answers here. Let me give you one more example of the ways in which federalism works. In Minneapolis, for example, there is currently a proposal um, to take away somewhere between seven million or eight million dollars of the police budget and devote it to other things. Right? Um, one of the calls is, well, let's take eight million dollars of the of the police budget and send it and give it to mental health. Okay, fine. Guess what? In Minneapolis mental health services are provided at the county level, which is a different tax structure. So it is not just the case <laughs> that you're gonna take money from the city budget and give it to the county. In fact, everybody understands that that's not what's gonna happen. Um, and so then the idea is, well, let's just build out the city's public health service to do more of this work. Well, okay, maybe, but like, why would you do that when the county is already doing this and $8 million isn't enough to provide, right? So this-ish 
is really hard. And it is a mistake to underestimate how hard it is. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working on it. Like, can I show you my gray hair? <laughs> um, but um, like, it takes a lot. It's not just about a theory and it's not just, not just about asking communities what they need and want, which I do think is the, the first step, right? There's all of that. And then there's the governance problem, which is prodigious. Thank you both for those answers. Um, and uh, uh, the governance, as a political scientist, the governance problem um, is, is something that I um, unfortunately think about a lot too. Um, <laughs> I, um, speaking, speaking of um, conversations that are happening at the community level, um, questions uh, and this, this question of what do we do with city budgets, state, county, federal budgets um, to keep people safe. Um, I want to, I, I, I'm going to have my last question before um, I, I bring in other voices um, from this group be about your article um, in the Atlantic with Tom Tyler Tracy. Um, I'm going to read a quote real quick from this article. So you say, if America is to move beyond its troubled and conflict laden relationship with its police, it must have a broader serious discussion about what democratic policing can and should be. What are police for? This is a moment for such a discussion. The crime rate has for several, for several years now been at historically low levels. The costs of police community conflict are once again clear. And in an era of shrinking municipal budgets, the costs of America's current style of policing have major effects on the ability of communities to provide other necessary public goods that are building blocks of vitality. For this discussion to be successful, it must involve the meaningful participation of all people in America's communities. So this question um, of what is it police are for, um, I'd, I'd like for both of you to reflect on kind of how you are currently pursuing answers to that question, what might be um, your answer today, um, or to whom are you like most inspired as a voice, as a voice or a set of voices who are engaging this question of what is it police are for? Elizabeth, you wanna go first? So, I mean, I think police, as we think about police and as we think about police historically have been, um, you know, agents of social control and uh, defenders of racial hierarchy and oppression. So, I mean, that, you know, from the early kind of forms and in, 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 in slave patrols to the present, um, you know, they, they, the, the kind of function of police, um, at least as far as poor people go and people of color go, um, have have been historically um, focused more on kind of like apprehension and identifying suspects to remove from the community than necessarily protecting people in white and middle class communities, um, especially in the 20th century, right? Um, police functions have been, you know, primarily about protecting property. So they're so police in low income community policing in low income communities of color is completely different. Um, than it is in in in, in middle class communities and, and white communities, and so in in that sense, um, you know, policing needs to be fundamentally it needs to end um, as we know it. I mean, I do think that we that public safety is important. We need to have a public safety function. But you know, after studying this this history and and also centering, um, you know, what residents them how residents themselves think about public safety and the various reforms that had been suggested historically, you know, that that policing doesn't, or that police officer doesn't necessarily look like an outsider who comes into a community who is fearful of the community and who then in turn, the community is fearful of in a uniform with a gun. And so that model of public safety, um, and I think, you know, I mean, this has been under discussion 
for, for, for half a century now, at least. But I mean, certainly, you know, in recent years with the kind of rise of um, the, the slogan defund the police, right? We're beginning to rethink the logics of that model of, um, of law enforcement. And I mean, and just really briefly on, on some of what uh, Tracy touched on at the end of her comment. I mean, I, I think a lot of the proud, you know, one way to think about defund, you know, the way that it's framed is something that's like negative and taking away. Um, and that, and that I think, um, has done some harm to the idea of, um, of reconstituting public safety as we know it. And I think one, I think taxes are really important. And one way that we can think about how to begin to invest in different models of public safety and invest in education and invest in decent housing and invest in job creation, um, which may be the most important thing is to think about our tax structure. The fact that we have, you know, like, who gets the biggest welfare in this country? Corporations. Um, you know, the richest people in this country actually pay less taxes than the middle class. Um, the entire tax structure of it uh, makes no sense in the United States. And if we begin to at least reform that, that's going to free up billions of dollars to begin to spend on public goods in an entirely different way than they have been. I mean, our tax structure has kind of like, you know, it, it's become more regressive coinciding with um, the rise of prisons in this country. So the fact that we tax the way they do, way we do in the U.S., I think is reflective of the fact that we are this mass incarceration society. And so, what what defund is really about for me, and, and is asking that that question of what are police for, but also calling on government authorities to make a different set of investments. Um, and I do think historically, you know, the federal government has played an important role in kind of taking the lead in protecting, um, in, in ensuring various protections for especially uh, racially, people who are, who are racially oppressed, um, but also thinking about ways that we could redistribute resources. And so I think that it is going to take, um, it is going to take a federal intervention for us to, to see these kind of national changes and transformations that are gonna be necessary if we want to build um, a more equitable society and and realize the promises of our founding values and um, you know the Civil War Reconstruction amendments. So I don't have a lot to add to that other than to say um, just to remind everyone this was not an article; it's an essay <laughs> that we wrote in the Atlantic. And the reason why it's important to mention that is like you have you have to sort of try to convey a lot um, in an economy of words. So there are a lot of ways to read what are police for. You know, one is to do what Elizabeth did, which is to say, well, what have they been for? What are they for right now? Um, and I co-sign everything she just said. You know, another way of thinking about it is to be forward-looking and to say, when we were asking that question, what are police for? We're talking about in the new era, in a new vision, in a, in a place we're really trying to um, think of safety, you know, the provision of safety by the state. Um, as as a public good. Well, what role do police, what are police for in, in that world? Understanding that police might not look anything like the policing service that as it exists today, that it is not necessary. When I'm asking what are police for, I'm not asking what are armed general purpose trained for, um, first responders for, although there might be um, a role for some of those people in, in some context, actually. Um, but, you know, when I'm talking about democratic policing, I'd like to, you know, and I wrote that before, you know, we, Gwen, finished our piece on protect and serve. And, you know, I've been writing a bunch of things, you know, all, all summer about this. I, you know, it's important to distinguish the police service as it exists today from the concept of policing um, as a public good, as an instantiation of um, a fully realized reconstruction of the police power. And in that context, you know, I want to use reconstruction capital R, right? Um, because if, you know, if you take a, a, a historical through line in all of this, um, the communities, and I think COVID provides a, a the COVID pandemic that we're living through um, provides a, a very good example. The, the communities that are experiencing all the violence, 
um, that I just spoke of in New Haven, as well as violence in the police response are the same communities that are experiencing higher rates of COVID infection um, and higher rates of death and higher rates of uh, maternal fetal death and higher rates of low educational attainment and you know, higher rates of lead poisoning, we can go on, which is a result of decades of disinvestment in these communities over time, which we've known for a very long time, but concretely um, when the Kerner Commission's report was made public, right? And we haven't done anything um, about that, which connects up with what Elizabeth was saying about the tax structure, right? And so in that context, um, you know, when I think about abolition, you know, and I wrote in 2017 in the Boston Review, policing as we know it must be abolished before it can be, be transformed. It is useful to connect that conversation, um, the abolition conversation with reconstruction um, and think about that aborted project, uh, a project that was aborted by white supremacist violence, right? Um, and, and think about that in the context of where we started this conversation, which is what does it mean to achieve community vitality, right? To my mind, um, a reconstruction project is necessary for that. And a reconstruction project that not only centers community, but acknowledges the necessity of state support. This is not a private project. <laughs> it's not private. And people deserve the support of the state, they deserve it. And I, for one, am gonna be spending the next 10 years before I retire, and yes, I am going to retire in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be fighting for that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be fighting for that. Thank you both. Um, and now I'm gonna turn uh, over to questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please uh, send those my way. Um, I have, uh, I'm gonna start first. Um, well, I'll start with th this question for Tracy because you've touched upon it a bit more, um, but can you say more? This is from Professor Goldsby about the governance problem. What does that encompass and why is it prodigious? And then kind of the second part of that question is how might, re quote, recovering positive police power break the log jams that federalism and or governance create? Yeah, uh, like that's such a, a long thing, but let me just give you a couple examples uh, just to say there's just not as much, especially with respect to safety as we think about it in the policing context that can be done at the federal level as people think right? It, it's just not a thing that can happen, right? In the same way that, you know, the federal government, the, the federal government actually, because of the way it's grown up, has more ability to mandate educational standards right now than it does to create national standards for how policing agencies should operate. So when you're trying to figure out what to do, you either use the federal government to provide technical re, um, technical assistance and resources at the agency level, or you try to figure out some way to mandate, to, to incentivize states to mandate agencies to do it. And that's a difficult project and we don't have a ton of time, but like I can give you very specific examples of how to do that. Like, you know, I, I've proposed to the current administration like ways you can do it. Um, but it's hard and it requires congressional approval so that if you don't have democratic majorities in, in both houses, it's hard to do. You can't do it by executive order. I mean, there are all these things um, that are, are really tough to do. So when you talk about the, you know, the positive project, you know, the, the strategy that we have been a, a, a adopting for the last several years has been to sort of think about it agency by agency, using demonstration projects, using kind of natural competition among these folks to be like, oh, I want to be like Eric Jones in Stockton. I mean, you know, that only gets you so far. Um, 
you can try to work at the state level to pass certain legislation for um, minimum standards, but legislators have to be motivated. Most, le most le state legislators are, are part-time part and they're not experts. They don't have staffs like the federal government does. And so there's a different role that organizations like, let's say the Justice Collaboratory might be able to play in producing model legislation. But then of course we can't lobby. So how are we <laughs> gonna get the legislation passed? Like that's the kind of stuff that I mean, uh, you know, and I'm about to be wonky, wonk, 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 but it's a wonky wonk problem. It's a super wonky wonk problem. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Elizabeth, or can I follow up with another question? Thank you, Tracy. Okay. Um, so this is an interdisciplinary question for you, Elizabeth, um, which is that if rank and file police think that knowing history doesn't help them do police work, would learning something like political science be more effective in their work? Yeah, I think it's, I think unfortunately it's, it's less of a, um, it's, it's not about an aversion to history, but I think more about an aversion to um, having discussions about racism and, um, and, and having discussions about um, uh, the nature of inequality. And so, you know, whether whether we approach that from a political science or sociological or historical framework, um, I think that that is is primarily what what they are adverse to. And um, you know, and this is not true across the board, right? But some of what I've heard is that, um, and this is you know, kind of a more specific example of what I was getting at, but that um, that because that that because of the kind of emphasis on um, systemic racism in police departments, uh, police have kind of like shied away from the issue altogether and have argued that, you know, like they have, and this is part of the, um, this is part of, you know, some of some of what especially conservative pundits have have used to explain the Ferguson effect that, that basically like following um, uprising that police retreat because they're, they're worried that if they make arrests or if they if they do their jobs that they're going to be called a racist or that anything that they do is somehow racist. So so part of it is you know that there is an aversion to addressing these issues head on and you know from from even the the procedural justice and um, module histor historical module trainings in Stockton to the co command college that I was talking about. I mean, nine out of ten officers will say, "Well, I don't see color. You know, I don't see color. I'm not racist. Yes, that might have happened. You know." 50 years ago, but like, that's not, that's, that's not how I do my job. Um, I'm colorblind. And so it's, you know, when, when that's the premise, it takes a lot of work and discussion to even kind of begin to peel back where you can begin to open people to, to being receptive, um, to understanding these kind of like larger historical and, and political dynamics um, at stake. Can I just add one thing to that, which is, Police are not unique, right? Right. So, I, and I think that's important to understand, right? They are not singular in any way. Um, you know, there are plenty of people that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis at this university who are no different from that. <laughs> uh, it's just that the the cost of their aversion to it is much greater. Um, but you know. Many of us on this Zoom call probably have kids in school and stuff. You know, think about the teachers you deal with. Um, you know, we we all encounter people in various versions of that. So I think that piece is worth saying, and and it's also an opportunity for me to lift up another one of our colleagues at the Justice Collaboratory, Jen Richardson. Um, who's a social psychologist who studies this phenomenon. It's universal. So we should be clear about that. Um, what, something that's co coming up in that point about, you know, there are so many people who in so many different roles who are participating in racialized surveillance, whether they're an educator, um, a social worker, um, or like I 
relatively but even like benign roles where they may not even be interacting with too many people. So something that I am thinking about um, in reference to the work that you're doing, Elizabeth, with police with police departments and educating them on history. I'm thinking about the local kind of grassroots political education that's been taking place um, um, in cities across the U.S. So teaching community community members, or also kind of harvesting the knowledge within and historical you know memory within the communities about um, the historic role of of police um, and state violence and surveillance. Um, and how that local knowledge ha has you know, maybe a particularly transformative role because of the way spatially situated. Um, and this is a bit of a ramble, but I'm thinking about that spatial situation, the work that you know, memory can do on the local level, but then kind of these acute barriers, as you've mentioned, Tracy, at the, the, at the you know, municipal, county, state, and federal level, and kind of what do we, what what kind of meaning might we make about, um, you know, this growth in political education and coinciding politi uh, mobilization um, amid a lot of governance barriers? Yeah, I just wondering if you can comment on that a little bit. Well, I think just briefly, I mean, it's it's a great question, and it speaks to the moment that we're in, and it's a reminder that you know, I mean, we've been talking a lot, and and many of um, most of our discussion has really been centered on the police and law enforcement, but that doesn't mean that like, you know, that 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 that's going to be the agent for for change, right? History, and particularly Black history, teaches us that you know, it is about organizing, it is about political education, that it takes time. Um, that it's not like an instant thing and that, you know, we've got to continually put pressure on the state in order to bring about the changes that we'd like to see. So I think, um, I think that's what's so exciting about this moment is that, you know, we just witnessed and, and this again gets to the, the, um, the comments, you know, how, how Professor Goldsby opened up this whole discussion. Um, the stakes are very clear. They've never been higher. We just witnessed what's being called the largest uh, mass movement in US history for anything. Um, but it was premised around the idea of racial justice and social justice. And I think it's up to us to keep this momentum going um, because it's not, you know, what history shows us is that, you know, policymakers um, and police chiefs and police unions, they're not going to make changes, they're not going to make any reform out of the goodness of their heart. It takes pressure. Um, and it's up to us to keep that that pressure on. And I think, you know, um, I mean, that's part of what's been what has been so important about some of the this moment and the technological advance of, of, of the, the last 15 years or so, right, because or five years even, um, because it's not as if this police violence is new. It's just that, and it's not as if black communities where this police violence happened weren't aware of it. It's just that it has been so localized. Um, and now, I mean, really beginning with Rodney King in 91, um, the nation and white people in particular have been, have, are now witness to this violence. And as that, the, the kind of like onslaught of that has continued to pace, um, especially, you know, during uh, Barack Obama's second term, We've seen the the kind the, the mobilization grow, and so I think now that we have you know everybody has their camera in their pocket, we're beginning to build this a kind of documentary evidence that can that has outraged people, um, so that now you know most most Americans, according to polling, do think there needs to be some kind of policing reform. Most Americans. Um, support the idea of Black Lives Matter and want to see racial justice. This is unprecedented. And so it's, um, so I think the public is becoming more educated and we need to, to continue that education and keep the pressure on, which is why, again, I think, you know, it's really exciting to be here at Yale and part of the Justice Collaboratory in this moment, because it does feel like, and <laughs> it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of work. We may not see it. Um, you know, in our lifetime, I don't know, Tracy, it may not fully happen by the time you retire. Uh, but, you know, it, we, we are beginning to churn out something new um, that hopefully will finally um, 
learn from and move beyond the le you know the, the lessons that we now know of all of the failed approaches and all of the oppressive and repressive measures um, that have shaped uh, dy dynamics of inequality and of um, of police community relations historically. Tracy, do you want to add anything? That was okay. good. And yeah, I know it's not happening before I retire, but I'm still retiring. <laughs> um, to, to follow up on this, this piece about time, um, momentum and unprecedented support, and then situating, kind of relating this moment to what seemed like a similarly pivotal moment post um, Kerner Commission. Um, Elizabeth, I, I wonder if based on your wisdom as a historian and as an activist scholar, if you could talk a bit about what, what is it gonna take to, to kind of shirk that historical path, mm -hmm. right? Particularly, um, of ensuring that that liberals, white liberal policymakers, do not um, do not shy away from the the the, ur the urgent and thought and you know historically situated um, and um, you know demands of community members right now. That's another really big question. I mean, I think you know, and it's not, and this is something that like my new research um, has really made clear to me. You know, the Kerner Commission was like the biggest post riot commission, but in many of the cities that experienced that kind of violence, you know, that they had like civil rights commissions or human relations commissions of, of their own, many of which were kind of modeled on the Kerner Commission, many of or all of which, you know pointed attention to the specific socioeconomic conditions in locale and in, in various locales, like the Kerner Commission, you know, um, recognized the role of white racism, but also like the Kerner Commission was very limited in terms of um, its kind of pathological and racist assumptions about, um, about poor black Americans, about the nature of black poverty, um, about black crimin criminality stemming um, you know, from ideas about criminal black criminality historically, but um, you know, really kind of taking hold in a new and important way following um, Moynihan's report. So I think one of the things you know, we don't need. Having said that, um, we don't the, the the kind of impulse after um, these moments of police violence is to you know start a commission or, or put together a task force, and we don't necessarily need another kind of national task force to study the problem of inequality and then you know essentially do an update to the Kerner Commission's recommendations which is saying we need a Marshall Plan for American cities we need a different kind of investments that would that would go beyond the war on poverty um and I think you know having said that th that's <laughs> that's what's needed we know what's needed these demands have been made and these recommendations have been made over and over and over again now for you know more than a half century um, and it's time to actually do it um, and, you know, as, as I just said, like, you know, I'm hopeful we're going to do it. It's going to take a lot of work, but it's also, I think that, um, that, you know, the, the, ele the recent election was really humbling because, um, you know, we have a lot, I mean, it's not just, you know, political education in, um, the communities that are kind of like ground zero for this policing, this kind of policing, but it's like political education throughout the United States, because, you know, the fact is that, Donald Trump uh, got the second highest number of votes for any presidential candidate in, in US history. 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. I mean, we see it now in the Georgia runoff election where you know it's basically based on, do you want these radical socialists, anarchists to take over and um, implement a Green New Deal and take your rights away and take police away and all of these things. So we, I mean, I think a lot of us recognize that that what it's going to take is a major structural intervention in the in changing the tax structure. You know, many of the things that we've mentioned, um, but that is going to be you know the process of actually realizing that is going to be substantial. So we don't need to begin that process by continuing um, to study the problem. I do think, having said that, and um, Tracy and I are on 
Um, I, know. I was like, what are you talking yeah. about? Why are we doing that thing? <laughs> we are on a task force right now at the National Academies um, that's looking at that, but that's looking specifically at racial disparity. See, that is something that's new. That has not been done. You know, there has not really been a task force that is that 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 is seeking to um, study and identify specifically the racial disparities within the justice system. That wasn't an objective of the Kerner Commission. That wasn't an objective of any of the um, commissions that I've seen or studied. And I think one step towards meaningful change is really documenting the ways in which policing and the criminal legal system in the United States um, targets uh, people of color and has exacerbated racial inequality. And so, you know, identifying, I think centering racism in that discussion is a necessary way to achieve change, but we don't need you know, we don't, we, we know that what we need is a structural transformation. And so, um, you know, we need to work towards building that rather than continuing to study that problem. Um, racism is something that, you know, and again, my experience working with, um, with police in California demonstrates is something that we still have a long way to go. And I think that the, um, you know, again, the, the support uh, for white extremism that we have seen really on, you know, not that it ever went away, but really on very visible display in recent months um, shows just how far we have to go in order to, to become a truly um, racially egalitarian nation. So how do I want to intervene? Um, I don't mean intervene as in I disagree with anything that you said. I'd just like to say something useful as we are getting to the end of this conversation. So I think the place that I want to build on is this idea of um, structure and juxtapose it against um, the idea of rights, which has been sort of the fundamental way of trying to push forward um, on, these, on these topics, right? Um, and, and I think given if you tie the structure and rights conversation to the point about federalism, you understand the ways in which identifying certain outcomes that you want, you know, like the Kerner Commission says people need all of these things, all right? Let's say we had said, okay, people have rights to those things, right? Then the question is, how is it that they're that government is actually gonna make good on um, giving people the material resources they need for those rights, you know, to effectuate those, those, those rights. And, and, and it's interesting, Elizabeth, that you mentioned voting because I just read a book yesterday in draft by a law professor, Guy Charles Uriel um, and his co-author, Luis Fuentes. And, um, you know, when you think about the Voting Rights Act, you have to understand that it, the United States Constitution actually does not give people <laughs> a constitutional right to vote. That is actually provided at the state level. And when you look at the ways in which the federal government has supported or not supported that, you know, on the one hand, we see that this election was sort of fraud and it felt too close and all of those people voted for this person that, you know, is essentially King George. Um, if you read the Declaration of Independence, as I did last night, about 80% of the complaints against King George actually apply to the person who is president of the United States right now, um, which is an interesting exercise. But uh, in, in any case, right, because we don't have a federalist, like a, a national context for effectuation of these outcomes to which we want to give people rights, it basically points up the demand for changing the structure of it, right? You know, that is, you know, if we could actually get universal voting and made that meaningful structurally, which in some sense requires upending federalism. Um, I, I hope I'm not being too uh, elliptical. I, you know, I, I'd love to share Guy's chapters uh, with you, if and which makes this point very clear. Um, then you'd see that there's actually a path, perhaps, to achieving the things that we have long known are, are necessary. And and that's a, it ends up being kind of a procedural justice point in a sense, because, you know. 
you need a in 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 the way that democratic governance works in this country you need a path you need a process for effectuation of these substantive rights to which people want to have access and people care a lot about that we know that from the social psychology work people care about having access to certain processes in order to you know make meaning of their their role in society but just we also know as a as just a a mechanical matter that's how you get this done right that's where power and you know and governance meet in terms of getting people what they want and need. I hope that made sense. Thank you both for, um, I think that that last question just underscored, you know, how much, um, how much we need this revolution, um, how much it is going, it is a reconstructive process. Um, that requires um, an, interdis an interdisciplinary space like um, the African American Studies Department that's leading this colloquial collo colloquium and the Justice Collaboratory um, that's doing similar work um, from, the, from a policy perspective. Um, we have, oh, we are completely out of time. Um, and I just uh, want to thank you uh, thank you both, Professor Hinton, Professor Mears, um, Professor Feenster, and, and Professor Goldsby for convening us. Um, I'm so grateful to have had the chance to be in conversation with you today. Um, and um, I, I wish everybody um, a, a healthy and safe um, a remainder of 2020. I thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Gwen. You thank did amazing you so Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're you were wonderful, my dear. Yep. Bye -bye. I think you're Thank you. <laughs> Bye. It's good to see you. Bye.